All right, so we last weekend we wrapped up the blessed life and just want to honor uh, Keegan, Pastor Matthew, for doing an incredible job uh, presenting the Word of God and the truth of God's Word. But today we're kicking off a new collection, something that we've actually talked about for a very long time. And this is part two of a series we like to call Wild and Free. I don't know if you were around several years ago. I mean, it was probably three years ago, actually. Over the summer, we did a series called Wild and Free, and it was specifically talking about the Holy Spirit and His role in our life. And there was just so much to cover that after six weeks of Wild and Free, we had to say, you know what? We're going to conclude, but we'll be back. This is our part two. And, uh, you know, some say part two is better. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. But I'm excited for this series. What we're going to focus on specifically over the course of the next several weeks is the gifts of the Spirit. Spiritual gifts. This might be a new concept for you. Maybe you've been familiar with this for a long time. But hopefully, oh, as we unpack each of the gifts, you're going to learn something new about Scripture, hopefully something new of yourself, and be able to activate those gifts in your life. So my heart and my prayer for you today is, be open to how God may want to speak to you as it relates to spiritual gifts. Keep a heart of humility and keep your hands open to say, God, I'm willing, I'm ready, teach me. Before we dive in, let's pray. Father, thank you for the fathers in the house. Thank you for being our perfect example of what a good father looks like. God, I pray that as we dive into your scripture and your word and we learn about the truth about the Holy Spirit and his role in our life and these gifts that he empowers us with, God, that our hearts would be open, God, that uh, our, our minds would be open, and that you would teach us, that your Holy Spirit would be the teacher, would reveal the truth of Scripture, uh, that it would convict us in the areas where maybe we've uh, denied or rejected our gifts or neglected our gifts, and Father, that it would convict us to want to deepen and develop our gifts. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, all God's people say it. So if you grew up in the church, you probably have had one of two experiences with the supernatural. You, pro you, had one, you could have had one experience where the supernatural really wasn't talked about a whole lot and where the Holy Spirit wasn't talked about a whole lot. And specifically related to the gift of miracles, it was told to you that that was just for one period of time but is no longer needed for today. That is the experience that I had. So it was a very Bible-centric church. We didn't really lean into the supernatural or the miraculous. But later on in life, I had an experience at a church that kind of shocked me, I guess you could say. I mean, I think the best way to say it is it kind of scared me. I walked into a charismatic church, full-blown Pentecostal. Just out of curiosity, uh, anybody grow up like me? Let me see some hands. All right, anybody grew up uh, Pentecostal? Can I also see some hands? Wow, about 50-50. All right, it's awesome. I love it. Uh, it, it. It scared me. Uh, the first thing that happened was everybody broke out into the gift of laughter. Apparently, I didn't have that gift. Out of the hundreds of people in the room, I was the one without the gift of laughter, and I, I, I love to laugh. And so I'm thinking, what, what are we laughing about? I love to jump in. And the uh, pastor walks over and says, have you been baptized in the spirit? I said, I've been, I'm a Baptist. I think I've been baptized in about everything. So I think so. Yes, like I'm all in, baby. Uh, but apparently I had not, uh, in his opinion, been baptized in the spirit because I was, anyways. So uh, as I kind of grew mature, I began to kind of pray into and seek and study the scripture to say, okay, maybe there is uh, a middle ground and maybe it's not full like we reject the Holy Spirit. And maybe we don't go full on chaosmatics. I don't know. I mean, charismatics. Uh, maybe there's somewhere in the middle. Uh, uh, and so that's what we're going to be talking about today. Over the next few hours, we're going to do an overview of the history terminology and some practical application for how we can move forward in discerning, developing, and deploying the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Y'all ready? Not a few hours. If you're new here, that's a total joke. Uh, it'll be just about 29 minutes and 22 seconds. Sorry. So John 4, 24 says, God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. 
2 Corinthians 3.17 says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. We believe that as you step into the supernatural, as you lean into who the Spirit is, as you yield to the Spirit, walk by the Spirit, listen to the Spirit, and obey what He tells you to do, you start to walk in what's known as a supernatural reality, a supernatural life. And that when you walk in that supernatural life, you experience truth and you experience freedom. This is why it's called wild and free. Because when you, st- when you start to listen and look for and obey in the supernatural, it gets wild. Like people getting healed on the spot. It gets crazy. People speaking in tongues. And at the same time, you get to experience a free life in the spirit. So would you step into the wild with me? The title of today's message is Spiritual Gifts 101. I'm going to do an overview of what's called pneumatology, beginning with who is the Holy Spirit. Pneumatology is the study of the Holy Spirit. And first, before we dive into the gifts of the Spirit, let's look at who the Holy Spirit is. The Holy Spirit is not an it. It's not a thing. The Holy Spirit is a person. It's the third person of the Trinity. We see that referenced in the Great Commission as well, to go and make disciples of all nations, to baptize them in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We see the perfect Trinity form there. It is three in one. In 2 Corinthians 13, 13, we see Paul give his only really Trinitarian benediction here when he says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Spirit be with you all. It's a powerful, it's just one verse, but it's incredibly profound speaking to the mystery of what we know as the Trinity or Trinitarian theology. The Holy Spirit is not only a person, the Holy Spirit is personal. You can walk by the Spirit. You can hear the Holy Spirit. You can obey the Holy Spirit. He wants to have a relationship with you. The Holy Spirit possesses emotions, intellect, and will. He spoke to Philip and gave counsel to the church at Jerusalem. He creates and uh, makes creative. He was there in the beginning of all creation in Genesis. He comforts and carries us in our weakness. He guides and leads. He regenerates and brings about rebirth. He sanctifies through conviction of our sins. And he's in tune with every detail of our life. He seals our salvation, fills us to serve and carry out the mission of God, and he empowers us to live a spirit-filled life. It's pretty incredible. Can you see how, pow- how, how much of the Christian life you're missing out if you are not in relationship and hearing and yielding and obeying the Holy Spirit? So he's a person and he is personal. Holy Spirit in Greek is... Let's, let's say that together. Pneuma, pneuma. The Holy Spirit in Greek is pneuma. It means air, breath, or wind. It's where we get our English word pneumatic, like a pneumatic tool. I know you know this one. <laughs> the term charismatic is derived from the Greek word as well. Uh, charisma comes from the root word charis, which means grace. And this is where we get our English word Charismatic. The English word is uh, compelling attractiveness or a charm that inspires devotion in others. So we have these English words that really trace back to a spiritual word in Greek. I, I, I actually just got back from Greece. I had the privilege and the honor of uh, officiating my brother-in-law's wedding. <clears throat> it was amazing. And in Greece, it's a thing that everyone you talk to tells you the meaning of every word. The very first Greek person I met, they said, what's your name? I said, Parker Manuel. Oh, man, man, what? Manuel in Greek. I I I know, I know, tell me anyways, because this is like really cool. Like God with us, all this day, they had this. And then they told me the whole root behind it. This is a thing in Greek culture is that they tell you the meaning of every word. So that's, this is exciting for me. It feels like I'm there. So the term spiritual gifts is charismata pneumatica. It is uh, the combination of the spirit of God and the gifts or the favor or the grace of God on your life. So to kind of 
put it into context. This is the Holy Spirit's active work in your life as a gift given by God's grace. He is the one that's activating the gifts. He's the one that's distributing the gifts. And he's the one that's giving the measure of the gifts. He distributes the gifts. He illuminates the truth of God's word. And he empowers us through those gifts to live a supernatural life. Charles Spurgeon says, without the spirit of God, we can do nothing. We are as ships without wind. We are useless. So, Practical application there is. If the Spirit of God were to remove himself from Pinewood, would we notice? Or would we be able to go about our routine? A pastor friend of mine was talking about the Spirit of God in his life, and he said, I want to be so overwhelmed by the Spirit, that if He left my presence, if He left my life, I would just fall flat on the floor, unable to move. I said, yes, that's what I want. That's what I want, not not just for each individual. That's what I want for a whole house. And that's what I want for us as a church. So that's who the Holy Spirit is. Number two, what are spiritual gifts? I just unpacked that a little bit. Spiritual gifts are mentioned in four key places in Scripture. So anytime that I'm preaching on a subject, or this is more of, more of a, a teaching, but anytime I'm preaching or teaching on a subject, it's always my hope and my prayer that this is a seed that is planted in your life that you get to go home and water. So I'm going to be giving you some passages of scripture, be pointing you to a few places. Go home, study this for yourself, especially over these next several weeks. But four key passages I encourage you to read. Ephesians 4, 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, in 1 Peter 4 through 10. These are the four key passages that reference spiritual gifts. I'm going to give us a definition of spiritual gifts. A spiritual gift is a spirit-given and empowered ability to serve him in ways that benefit others, promote unity, equip believers for building up the body of Christ, and it's for the advancement of the kingdom of God. So, As I said earlier, where do the gifts come from? The source of the gifts is the Holy Spirit. Mentioned three times in one of those passages that I told you. 1 Corinthians 12, 11, Ephesians 4, 7, and 12, 3. He decides who gets what and when. This is very empowering for us. This should teach us that we then cannot uh, want what other people have. We cannot compare our gifts to other people's gifts. We should just simply be grateful for the deposit that the Holy Spirit has made in our life and the grace that he has given us. Should cause us not to compete and not to compare, but this is meant to complement one another. The foundation of the gifts is love. This is in 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3. This is a very famous text, oftentimes recited at weddings. I've recited at weddings. It's a beautiful text. It's it's on what is love. But really, it is what is the gifts with the foundation of love. This is specifically speaking to the gifts of the Spirit. It doesn't matter what gift you have or what gift you think is the greatest. If you do not have love, That gift is meaningless. It is useless. Can be damaging. Could be annoying. The example given in scripture of somebody using their gift but not being in love is is this. How many of you love that experience? It's a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal using your gifts, but not having love. Love is the foundation of all of the gifts that we're going to be talking about today. All right. I think the point has been made. Moving on. The primary purpose of the gifts is to build up the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 14, 26. To build others up, to promote unity, 
not division, and equip believers for service, Ephesians 4. Now, there's a few perspectives on the miraculous gifts specifically. First, we have the cessationists. This is what I was referencing earlier and how I grew up. <clears throat> the cessationists believe that the miraculous gifts have ceased and that the apostles of the new replace the prophets of the Old Testament and that the purpose of the miraculous gifts were to authenticate the apostles. And now that we have the apostles, we have the written word of God, the miraculous gifts are not needed for today. This is cessationism. And this is what cessationists believe. Specifically, have concluded that the gift of prophecy has ended in that early church era. Now, the cessationists have some pretty valid concerns. Uh, one of their concerns is that the miraculous gifts can lead towards emotionalism and experientialism, and that that can be held as a higher regard than the authority of Scripture. Another concern that they have is that the prophetic can be abused of people who can foretell things over people's life that may not be true or foretell events that may not happen, a.k.a. pastors who maybe say somebody's going to be president and then they don't become president, if you understand what I'm saying. Valid concerns and uh, valid critiques. Then I have an actual image here that I want to put up of kind of the positions on miraculous gifts, cessationists and the continuationists. Within the continuationists, you have the far extremes, which is the Pentecostalism. The Pentecostalism was uh, really started at the Azusa Street Revival. It took place in 1906. Is that water? You mind if I have a sip of that water? Forgot my water, fam. Oh my gosh, that is so tasty. The uh, Pentecostalism was founded at the Azusa Street Revival, took place in 1906 in Los Angeles, led by William J. Seymour. How many of you are familiar with the Azusa Street Revival? Lasted for nine years. This is an incredible movement, incredible revival. The Holy Spirit fell on people and it became this move of God and that we now call Pentecostalism because the Holy Spirit came on the early church on the festival of Pentecost. Pentecostalism is one of the largest and fastest growing church traditions in our day. The primary critique of the Pentecostalism uh, is that baptism of the Holy Spirit haps, happens subsequently to salvation. Another critique is the tendency to put the authority of their experience over the authority of the Bible when the two are not in agreement. Now, along that same line of continuationism is what's called the third wave. You hear, and this is true in a lot of things in theology. You have extremes and then you have something in the middle. And we're all trying to define what that is in the middle. And oftentimes we have no idea where we fit into the middle. And so this hopefully is a little bit helpful. This is from a resource on Logos. You have the harsh cessationists, the hard cessationists, soft cessationists, chaosmatics, uh, Pentecostals, first wave, charismatic, second wave, and the third wave is uh, evangelical third wave within the continuationists. This third wave charismatic movement was coined by the late Peter Wagner, who was a professor at Fuller Seminary. And then John Wimber, who was also a professor at Fuller Seminary, who was the founder of the Vineyard Movement. Anybody familiar with the Vin Vineyard Movement from the 80s? Anybody a part of the Vin Vineyard Movement? Come on, let's go. You are here because of the third wave, John Wimber. He launched this movement, and it has uh, since been taken over by uh, and led by a guy named Jay Pathak, who is a local Coloradan, local guy just down in Arvada. The best way to understand this third wave movement, it is Pentecostalism with a seatbelt on. <laughs> they, they hold both a really high view of Scripture and a really high view of the Holy Spirit's work and miraculous activity within the church. So, 
If you're wondering where Pinewood lands, we're the third wave movement. We also hold a high view of scripture and a high view of the miraculous gifts within the church and within the world. We are in that middle category. I say, I I wanted to give you this kind of description of where people can fit in. And I want to also say that I believe that this should not cause any believer to be divisive. The point of the gifts is to be what? (laughs) Unified. One of the purposes of the gifts is that the body would be unified, not divided. So this is not anything that we should divide over. For example, in the cessationist camp, some theologians that I love is J.I. Packer, Norman Geisler, Dan Wallace, and B.B. Warfield. I study these guys on the regular in preparing messages and learning about theology. And they're cessationists. Some on the more continuationist side is D.A. Carson, John Piper, Wayne Grudem, and Sam Storms. I study them. I think they are incredible theologians. I have close friends that are on both camps. I have pastoral mentors in both camps. And if I had to guess, out of this many people in a room, we are probably all in different and varying camps on this subject as well. This should not be anything that divides us. We should be unified as it relates to spiritual gifts, wherever you land. I say it this way, there should be a generous measure of grace and generosity. To quote the Augustine, who in particular, we're not quite sure where he lands on this subject because in some of his earlier writings, it's more cessationist, his later writings, more continuation. Regardless, uh, he says it this way, in essentials, unity, and not essentials, liberty, in all things, charity. All right, that's what the gifts are. How many gifts are there? Now, if you do a study, you can do your own study. Go read these four passages of scripture that I showed you. Kind of the more literal and the more targeted brings us to around 19. Some theologians and some seminaries really push it to about 25 spiritual gifts in all. At Pinewood, we've landed at 24. And if you're wondering the one we left off, you have to ask me about it later. But we've landed on 24 gifts that we believe that the Holy Spirit gives you. And then number four, who has these gifts? All right, now, just as a review, we talked about who the Holy Spirit is, some of the the Greek words, the foundation of what it means to have spiritual gifts. Uh, We talked about what the gifts are, how many there are, the purpose of the gifts, Now, the question, who has these gifts? Are these gifts for the gifted, the special, maybe those on the platform? Absolutely not. Scripture clearly teaches that if you profess Jesus as Lord of your life, you repent of your sins, you surrender your life to Christ by faith alone, that the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. And when the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, he manifests, he deposits a gift in your life. So if that's you and you're here and you're a follower of Jesus, good news for you today. May this may be the first time. You didn't know that you were getting a president on Father, a a president. I hope that's not happening right now. A present on Father's Day, a gift. A realization of a gift from the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, 7 says, A manifestation of the Spirit is given to each person for the common good. I want to read this passage in 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 21. It's a little lengthy passage, but I think it helps us define who has the gifts. For just as the body is one and many members, and all the parts of that body, though many, are one body, so also is Christ. For we were all baptized by one Spirit and one body. Whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, we were all given one spirit to drink. Indeed, the body is not one part, but many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body. It is not for that reason any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong in the body. It's not for that reason any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body was an eye, that would be one very odd body. 
If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God has arranged each one of the parts in the body just as he wanted. And if there were all the same parts, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. What we see here in 1 Corinthians 12 through 21 is we see unity in diversity. Unity in diversity. Paul is using the body as an analogy to describe the church, us. That there are many different parts, but together those parts, not just being aware of those parts, but those parts active create the body of Christ in beautiful diversity. Here's a picture of uh, some of our growth track graduates and the diversity of our gifts. This is just from this year. These are the 24 gifts. And can you see that not one person is the same? Each person is unique. Each of those parts working together forms one whole. And one whole of the body of Christ filled with the Holy Spirit activating is an unstoppable force. This is the uniqueness of Pinewood. Now, I like to say in our growth track, growth track is where we take the spiritual gifts test and we just, you discover your gifts and it's the beginning process of helping you discover your gifts. And I like to tell them there is no such thing as an isolated body part. Scripture clearly teaches that here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, that, the, that there's no such thing as like a wandering ear. I say it would be very odd to see just a lonely toe or a creepy hand. I mean, that's super creepy what's happening right now. But it, it was, there's no such thing as an isolated body part. When you become a follower of Jesus, you are now a part of the body of Christ. And these spiritual gifts, if left dormant as part of the body, is one significant part missing from what God has called us to be and who God has called us to be and what God is calling us to do. So no matter what gift you have, we need it activated in this church. We need you. There is no such thing as a big gift and a small gift. Any gift given by the all-infinite, omniscient, all-powerful Holy Spirit is a, it's the biggest gift you've ever gotten in your life. It's the biggest gift I've ever gotten in my life. And let us not be a people that neglect the gift. Now, I'm gonna end by giving you a practical handle of how you can take your next step in helping to discover your spiritual gift. Many of you have maybe taken a spiritual gifts test. If not, I wanna highly encourage you to take a spiritual gifts test. Um, we have growth track coming up. We'd love for you to sign up for that because I believe that I could give you the link to take the spiritual gifts test and that would be great. You would discover some things and there's some great ones online that I can also point you to. But I think discovering your spiritual gifts is best, best done in community. You discover your gifts, community speaks into that gift, and it's also best done in the house of God with spiritual leadership that can also speak those gifts over your life. Here's some very practical questions that may help you discover your spiritual gift. These are, some, these are from Pastor John Finocchio. Where do I sense the joy of Christ? Very practical questions to help you discern your gifts. Where do I sense the joy of Christ? Where have others seen effectiveness? in me. Where do you uniquely carry a burden or a passion for? I love it when people come to me with like issues they have in the church because it quickly reveals to me the thing that they're passionate about. Oh man, that is so, man, thank you for sharing that with me. What if God has made you frustrated about that because you're the solution to the problem? What if God has put that holy discontent in you that we should, be a, we should be a people that serves the homeless more? Great. Man, maybe that is your calling in this house to lead people to love and serve those that don't have a home. 
Man, I wish we prayed more. Man, come on, we have a prayer team that intercedes. You should join that team, be a leader on that team. What is your discontent? What's the thing you have a burden for, a passion for? What has been prophesied over you? This is significant. What if people said and prophesied over your life that maybe in that moment you knew that was from God? But yet over time, you've let kind of lay dormant and kind of neglected. I, I, whenever I was out of town, my, I, I had set up an irrigation system because I, I'm kind of obsessive about grass in the lawn. You know, as most dads are, you know, I mean, it's, I think it's just kind of like when you become a dad, it's like, and here's your, you now care more about grass than anything else card. Um, and I set up these kind of irrigation things that were supposed to go off and it's going to work flawlessly. My grass was going to be, I was going to come back and it was going to be so tall, so green, so wonderful. One of the sprinkler heads got stuck. Why? I don't know. It's worked every day for weeks. It got stuck. So one part of my grass was just lush. Looked like a golf course. It was gorgeous. The rest was burnt up. It looked terrible. And I was really sad and I've been overwatering my yard ever since. Pray for me, pray for me <laughs> and my water bill. This is like it is a spiritual gift. There could have been a moment in time where there was a seed sown and somebody spoke something over your life, but over time you have not watered that thing, you have not developed that thing, you've not prayed into it, you've not asked people to speak that into your life and now it's dying off and it's neglected. Maybe God's calling you to come back to that gift that's been prophesied over you. And finally, what do you believe the Holy Spirit has personally spoken over you in regards to your spiritual gifts? Now, this was more of an introduction to spiritual gifts, hopefully to help set a framework for you as we continue to unpack some of these gifts. But over the next several weeks, as we unpack these gifts, these are some of the questions that I want you to ask. Man, I, whenever we talk about a gift, man, I have a burden for that. I have a passion for that. Oh, that gift, somebody's prophesied that over my life. You know, over these next few weeks, be praying, God, what are my gifts? What have you personally and uniquely gifted me with? Scripture teaches us that it's a good thing to desire the gifts. But how we desire those gifts, we should desire them with a humble spirit and a humble posture.